All right, before we move into this, let's talk about who the three main characters are so you understand the symbolic identities. Regina, she is the fertility goddess. She is depicted by many names, most importantly known as Ishtar, Queen of Heaven. Now, the, the rest of the video is going to support exactly what I'm saying here, and you're going to see that that's exactly what the movie's saying. So, Regina is the fertility goddess. And I want you to remember that rabbit that you see that little girl holding basically underneath her shadow, as we saw in Isaiah chapter 34. We're going to see again. So the rabbit represents fertility. We've got Easter, Easter, Ishtar, all dedicated to this fertility goddess. And associated with the resurrection of a fallen deity, but it's not Jesus Christ. Now, her little sister, Samantha, Sam, red, white, and blue, the rebel, is... USA. Uncle Sam. Samantha is symbolic USA, the material girl. And this is unique, and it's going to be unique to the perspective of this channel, as you're going to see that, man, I've been right on target the whole time. I told you that they're only going to destroy a portion of Babylon. I said Babylon's double. It is both commercial, material, the material girl, Samantha, Think about it. Think about it. Babylon is commercial and ecclesiastical. Ecclesiastical means spiritual, religious. Ecclesiastical Babylon isn't going nowhere. That's what Ishtar represents. Now, Samantha represents more or less the lands and then the founding of these lands of America. She's representing a multi-layered perception of understanding, but you see her quite plainly symbolized with the red, white, and the blue. Keep in mind that at the end of the movie, they only fake her death, and it's faked with the sodium pentothal, and we know that the sodium is what? It's salt. We know that the millstone is off the coast of the East Coast, which is salt water. We know that there's going to be a huge inundation of tidal waves, tsunamis that takes place against the east coast of the United States being centered at New York City. Sodium salt, pentothal. This is truth serum. This is going to reflect back to the truth movement on YouTube as being about 90% corrupt. And that even the history of truth serum as it was being used by agents in the past proved that the truth serum really didn't bring anybody to speak any truth. Well, that's exactly what this truth movement is being used to help knock out good old red, white, and blue USA. You see all these, a lot of these truthers out there are given the spin. They ain't given the truth. And it's going to relate back to the fractal of them giving Sam to knock her out, but really to fake her death, to make it appear that she was dead. That's the commercial part of her that they've gotten rid of. They're going to maintain her for the ecclesiastical purposes for their ritual, occultic-based philosophies of what they perceive as the golden age, as what they perceive the lands that they think that they're going to inherit. And this is all displayed in Isaiah chapter 34. So Samantha, red, white, and blue, the material girl, represents at this point a two-portion identity as it's reflected with the lands and the founder. And then it further relates in the variable of the portion of this land that is now turned to a commercial identity of which they have created for the corruption, the deception to weaken the common man. And now that they've got the common man so weak, they're going to get rid of this material corruption and basically fake the death of their land, America, but through the commercial perceptual identity of this commercial girl, a.k.a. New York City. Mm-hmm. That's right. This commercial girl, Sam. So Sam represents the USA and all of her many variable identities. More importantly, commercial Babylon. So now we have Hector. And Hector is going to give us a three-part identity also. Lo and behold, Hector represents himself or 
they've chosen an actor of Mesoamerican descent. When I say Mesoamerican descent, I mean of Mexican nationale. And that's no accident. That's no accident at all. And I'd like to call your attention to Mesoamerica itself, more importantly, ancient Mesoamerica. And I want you to think about some deities that are famed in those lands, going by the titles of Quetzalcoatl, the plumed serpent. And then as we go further into South America, he would be known as Veracocha. And both or all three of these titled identities are depicted as a tall, bearded, pale-skinned, Nordic-like individual. In other words, a white person. But yet, this emissary of the serpent, now it's not the serpent king himself, but it is a descendancy of these serpent kings that is representing the plan and the fullness of the ideology of their master, Inki, the Nehesh, which means serpent. So Inki is the true plumed serpent. Quetzalcoatl, the emissary that helped build the Pyramid of the Sun and the Moon, which is right outside of Mexico City, Teotihuacan, of which I've actually visited firsthand, uh, is connected to the very same coded, architectural, symbolically displayed symbolism that we have in ancient Giza. The Giza site where we have the, the Great Pyramids of Giza. The same coded numerics, the same coded pi equation as equates to the circumference of the earth, the same 52 degree as it's equated back to the magical number of Thoth and the 52 week which creates the solar year as it relates back to precession and then it's going to relate back how I timed the Garden of Eden at 36,288 BC um, if you didn't know that well, long story short, Hector being of, of Mesoamerican descent as basically showing himself as an early emissary for these next coming character identities. And then the second identity that he displays is Santa Claus. And then that fits in perfectly with the understanding of the material portion of commercial Babylon. And then Santa Claus itself, the character that he displays later in that movie, is wearing red and white. Well, that just so happens to be the colors of northern Israel. And Santa Claus just so happens to come from the north, does he not? And this is the deception that he brings, is those material gifts and toys, supposedly under some geese or identity of some religious respect to Jesus Christ, in which it's really not. It's a, it's a, it's a design of deception in order to eventually weaken the precepts of the people of what the truth really is. So the Santa being red and white, the colors being red and white, which are being symbolized with northern Israel, which is being connected to their deity, their chief, their king, Apollyon, where you see in Isaiah 28, or you're going to see in Isaiah 28, where they make a deal with hell. They make an agreement, or they make a deal with death and an agreement with hell. We know that Apollyon is this king over hell, which is connected to these Danites. And at the end of the movie, you see, what, Danny, Mason, Keter. Okay, DMK. And then what do they do? What does Danny Mason Keeter do? Gets gets Sam. That's right. So the Danites and, in other words, the unicorns and the bulls shall come down with them, just like we see in Isaiah 34. The Danites, which is going to be the bulls, and then we see unicorns, which is northern Israel, which is, more importantly, Ephraim which is being symbolized also with the Masons, then it's being symbolized further with the red and the white, and that's going to be their material gifting, which is going to be the material inherited kingdoms that they hope to receive. So as we go further into Ankh Goldman, in other words, Hank Goldman, as he shows up into a cowboy, whoa, that's him showing himself as the fallen prince. That's right, he's a cowboy. Why is he a cowboy? Well, Ishtar's one of her symbols is the cow. And I told you this is related back to the sacred feminine because of these fallen sons of God were called the bulls. And what do they need? What do these bulls need to mate with? Well, they needed to mate with the daughters of men. In other words, the cows, which became the symbol for the sacred feminine. That's right. That's right. So good old Ankh, Hank, 
Hank is an anagram for Ankh, and we're going to talk about that, which is an Egyptian philosophical represented symbol that has everything to do with physical and spiritual immortality. Exactly the same thing that false Israel is hoping to achieve by releasing this being, and the exact same thing that this being is hoping to achieve in the material realm. And that's what that Ankh of his name, and then of course we know the gold man, the gold man, the new man, the golden age, the new world order. He is this leader, this manifested ruler of this new world order, which is covertly and conveniently disguised as the thousand year kingdom age in the Hebrew Bible. So that's who your three characters are. And it's 100% perfectly going to fit all of the other symbolisms that you see here and everything that you see these characters enact as we move forward. So in order for me to help you understand Regina, fertility goddess, Sam symbolized commercial Babylon, USA, and then Hector, the savior, in other words, the serpent king, Ankh Goldman, all right there, perfect coding. Let's, before we begin, let's focus on the color purple real quick here so that you can see that, ah, uh, you can see that there's a lot of people out there trying to steer you wrong, just like they're trying to steer you to get in, to focus all your attention on Saturn, when in reality, you should be focusing your attention on the symbolism of the moon. Okay? Big time. Big time. It's biblically specific. All of this has happened on lunar-based cycles and rituals of the moon. I mean, look at, if I have it here real quick, many of you know that picture of Baphomet. What do we got here? What do we got? A crescent moon, crescent moon, a waning and a waxing, a waxing and a waning. You have to realize that you people ain't telling you stuff on purpose on these channels and they're purposely filling your head with so many of these news stories that are really meaningless and divergent of the true nature of the truth of coming things upon us. It's keeping you preoccupied. They're not trying to occupy Wall Street. They're trying to occupy Yall Street. Y'all Street, the entirety of your path. They're trying to occupy all about your time and to take it up so that you are not prepared, so that you're not ready to do this spiritual battle, that you don't have strong faith and that you don't have a good standing in the truth. So we're going to use this color purple as the understanding of who's out there telling you guys the truth and who isn't. And then the movie itself is going to be the control. It won't be me. The movie will be the control of this lab experiment that we're going to take with this color purple. So we got a whole bunch of hundreds of YouTube channels that are telling us that this color purple has everything to do with Saturn, blah, 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 blah. Okay? And in reality, we've got one other YouTube channel, just all by its lonesome, telling everybody that this color purple has everything to do with the last crown chakra and that's going to be what you're looking at right there and then this is going to be biblically specific and if these cats are talking about the bible and when i say cats um pun intended when these cats are talking about the bible and they want to start telling you guys what's happening and giving you the fullness of what the biblical ramifications are you need to understand that that's what the bible is telling you also this is going to be chapter 49 the book of genesis talking about the blessings being on the top of ephraim's crown the blessings of thy father hath prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills they shall be on the head of joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren now who are the descendants of joseph well they would be Ephraim and Manasseh. Just like you see here that Manasseh and Ephraim are being adopted in to the 12 tribes. And then Ephraim is being exalted and actually being given the name Israel. And this is why you see the descendancy of Joseph is going to receive all of these blessings on the crown of the head of him. Now, that's why ain't nobody telling you the truth about what this purple is because they're hoping to achieve the same thing. They're hoping to get rid of everybody for their selfish, egotistical wants and desires. And 
they're trying to cover up what the true code of this purple is. And this is why you see all the news agencies, any of the big money industries, all the big banks, everything's coded propaganda with purple, purple, purple. People wearing purple because they don't know why they're wearing purple because other people wearing purple. So they're just going to start wearing purple too. Everybody wearing purple. I saw Michelle Obama on TV today coded up in purple perfectly. And that's exactly what they're trying to tell you. And they're speaking a language they think you don't understand. And you're not going to understand it as long as you keep listening to these people that are pumping this Saturn, 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 Saturn. Saturn's a planet. Behind the planet identity title, the name with letters, which is actually separate from the freaking planet itself because the planet ain't a letter and it ain't been created by man. It's a gaseous giant that's on its way towards an evolutionary path to solidification and that it has imploded moons by the pool of its gravity, which is pulling material mass into its into its center core, which is going to help further solidify this planet. And it's not an unnatural event. It's actually not too unique of an event. There's many planets in the solar system out there that are planets just like Saturn. So planet Saturn ain't evil. But the symbolism for Saturn, as they're connecting it back to Satan, will bring you back to the Bible. It will bring you back to the truth of what I'm trying to tell you. And none of this has anything to do with that planet out in space. It has everything to do with a coded history that has been secretly encoded into astrology, astro now theology, is what they're calling it. And then that's trying to tell you that within the Bible, they're seeing a totally different picture than what they're trying to present to you. But what they're trying to present to you is the spin. So I'm taking the spin, slowing it down and stopping it. And you can see it for what it is. So the purple in the movie is going to tell you that it's associated with their inheritance of the earth. And that's why you're going to see this fertility goddess is going to inherit the earth in Isaiah chapter 34. More importantly, this land of Basra associated with the Dume, which I've got biblical proof is going to tell you that it's the believers in Jesus Christ, but we might not have the time to look for that. But this land is associated with Revelation chapter 11, that great city, which is going to be Gotham. This is going to be that destruction that takes place there as it's associated further with the 13 colonies of the East Coast. There's the unicorns, there's the bulls. This is why good old Aunt Goldman is coming back as a cowboy because he has basically been brought about by the genetic cloning of these ancient serpent king DNAs which has all been passed upon by the sacred feminine, the two thirds more genetic material that the female gives to the offspring than the male does and that's where the rights of succession come in, that's why they intermarry into the female bloodlines to keep the stock pure and this goes further into detail with why the pharaohs began to preserve themselves, even trying to preserve their semen and their penises so that this genetic material what they were being taught would bring them about in a material identity but the fullness of the lie of the fallen prince was to preserve it so that he could fulfill himself within that genetic remnant which were those who were written out of the book of life from the very foundations of the world so this genetic material has been written out of the book of life which means it has forsaken the truth the truth of the spirit of truth it has rejected the living seal of God by their own will because they've rejected God by their own will. That DNA is now basically by spiritual law able for the spirit for the fallen prince to use because it's by the will of the people that had the DNA that now are allowing that spirit fallen entity to possess that matter. And because the seal has been broken in their identity. And we, man, the seal ain't no joke. It tells you that in Revelation chapter 9. It says the only people that are going to be able to be hurt by the locust are those that don't have the seal of the living God in their forehead. Well, you better learn fast that these occultic factions are trying to think that that's them. They're trying to think that they're the ones that got the seal of the living God in their foreheads and that they're not going to be hurt by the locust because they're actually trying to bring the locust in. But in reality, it's double. Give unto Babylon double. Babylon don't realize everything reflects back that it tries to reflect to us. We're the ones with the true living seal upon our foreheads. We're the ones that have Jesus Christ up upon the cross if you maintain faith in him. And then through that faith in Jesus Christ, these locusts got no power over you. I promise you that. And I know that firsthand. I promise you that. So Isaiah chapter 34, guess what? 
after this great blood sacrifice, let's talk about this movie. This movie's got what? They need blood in it, but there's a spin on it. They're spinning information on it also. So just to get you further down here, the blood sacrifice takes place. The land starts being inhabited by mythical creatures, right? All these birds of heaven, right? Mythical creatures. Here's Ishtar, right? There's her owls. There's the great owl. There is our Ishtar. And then she's got her nice little shaped conical witch's hat on that is shaped up with horns. Notice that she's the sacred feminine, the voluptuous woman, and she's also submitting the lions down here. If you want to know further about that, you need to check out Ezekiel chapter 19. And you're going to see her submitting these very same two lions right there in that chapter. So there's her symbolized with the owl, as she's also associated with Queen of the Night, Queen of the Heavens. And then this owl symbolism comes in as its connection with wisdom. In other words, Sophia, just as you see it connect back here with Baphomet, there's the same old breast, there's the same old philosophy connecting all of this back to everything I've been telling you. Now we take it back to Isaiah, the strongest verse I feel here in chapter 34. There shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow. There shall the vultures also be gathered, every one with her mate. Now the vultures are also known as the Nesher, and I think that that is, I think it's Nesher, and then that should translate to eagle also. We know that the eagle represents Rome. We know that the eagle represents Ephraim. We know that the eagle represents false Israel, represents USA, represents Danny. Mason Keter. There shall the vultures also be gathered, every one with her mate. As we see, they're coupled together with Sam. And then we also know that the great owl Regina Ishtar, the fertility goddess, is gathering the children, the multiple, the multiple, the multiple cultural children under her shadow. And then they plan on going on inheriting the land from there on out. And it's right there at the end of the movie. And notice that when they're taking the pictures at the end of the movie, when Regina and Aunt Goldman are taking the pictures with the two kids and that girl is holding that rabbit, which symbolizes the fertility. What is Regina wearing? Look at it, guys. Look at what she's wearing. Go to the movie and check it out. She's wearing a gigantic dress that has from shoulders to waist an upside down triangle. What does that symbolize? It symbolizes the birth womb. And there's that drawing I did some time ago that I had no idea what I was doing. And there is the birthing and everything's coming out of it from the false prince, the new world order, the Pleiadians, the fake supposed aliens that are working with these beings, the AKA Danites. There's that upside down triangle, the birth which is symbolizing the heavens. And then when we have the inverted triangle, guess what? We have the masculine identity, the material identity, which is going to represent the rising Kundalini serpent spirit from the dust of the earth as he unites with the queen of heaven, AKA Ishtar, as this is all going to also be symbolized around the moon. Now, unreal. So at the end of the movie, they show you she's wearing the gigantic upside down triangle when they're taking pictures. And then look behind her, right behind the triangle is an iron, a metal upright triangle. What does that represent? Iron Man, Orion Man, Ankh Goldman, the pyramids of Giza aligned up with a belt of Orion. Think about it, friends. Think about it. So if you go and you look at the movie, you already know that everything I'm telling you right now is right. You go to the end of it, you're going to see that I've known it before it happened. And that everything that I've done, the Spirit has allowed me to code the truth against their lie so that we could all see the contrast and know what the reality is. And that's, if you're able to receive, obviously most of you guys are. So, there are your three characters. It took 24 minutes to give you the fullness of it. So, the purple, guess what? It's related to the crown chakra, which is related to this rising crooked serpent which at the very end of this age, which is being symbolized by six previous ages that came before it. And this would be symbolized by the Garden of Eden. These chakras are 
seven in number. The main chakras are seven in number. That's within the anatomy of the human body, the energy anatomy of the human body. Now they are real. They are a part of our original design. They're a part of our original creation. And this is why this is something that the sons of God before the rebellion, Job chapter 38 lines one through seven were about and revealing to us eventually. But the serpent himself tries to circumvent that after the rebellion and he begins to use the chakras just to teach this understanding to the descendancy of the daughters of men who become the Elites and now they think they're the only ones that achieve this illumination or this spirit progress on this world but they're doing it through the abomination of desolation which is allowing the serpent spirit presence to ascend the path of their temple the path of their spirit progression of their chakra now I'm going to do a video that explains the reality of what the chakras are, is that they evolve over the entirety of the collective of mankind. They also are relevant in the individual progress of mankind, the individual himself. How much spirit progress a person has is what level of spirit residence they have how high it's risen into the entirety of their being. Just as Jesus Christ says, I dwell in the house of my believers. So if Jesus Christ says, my father has many mansions in heaven, more importantly, there are seven mansions that are related to this particular portion of material creation, where the material beings from this material creation go to as the spiritual abode known as the seven mansion worlds. We go to these seven mansion worlds. After we complete that, we start what's known as our heavenly career. I've already showed you guys that in the Bible, it describes that we're taught at these mansion worlds. In other words, you can think of them like the big colleges of the universe, where all the things that have been done wrong to us here are corrected there in the correct way, in the true loving service of the angels and others that are created to do it on the other side. So these chakras have been over run they've been overtaken by serpents they have bastardized the knowledge they've corrupted it they've twisted it they've contorted it they've tried to make it something their own when in reality it's not but nonetheless you need to understand that in reality we never pierce this supposed crown chakra we maintain the spiritual identity because piercing this crown chakra actually means death for us that's when we pierce through the material and enter into the spiritual abode. We pass. We pass from our mortal existence. So in reality, we don't ever need to achieve the crown chakra as a piercing, destructive event because we will maintain the sixth sense understanding, which is all located at the third eye region where we see in Revelation chapter 9, it describes those that are sealed with the living God in their foreheads. That's the third eye. That's the cross that Jesus Christ is supposed to be upon, and that represents the crossing of the two hemispheres of the brain to the opposite regions of the perceptions of the eye. That's the cross. So we always would maintain a collective evolution towards this sixth sense identity, and that's where you know you have your intuition, that's where you have your clairvoyance, your clairaudience, your ESP, all of those things that are associated with higher spiritual progressions and meanings that have been cut off from us because these guys right here corrupted the knowledge in the beginning. So in order to progress the spirit into your life and to gain a certain amount of spiritual quickening or a certain amount of spiritual progression, progressive evolution of spiritual insight you don't need no serpent you need jesus christ and then he will dwell in your house and then as long as you walk within the path that he himself has laid love your neighbor as yourself love your father with all your might his spirit progress can ascend up the scale and then achieve its dominance upon the cross of your third eye sight on your forehead just as revelation chapter 9 declares that the seal of the living god is upon the forehead of his believers and those that are sealed that have this absolute faith and how do you have absolute faith in the father when well, you start living his will when you live his will guess what his miracle can manifest through you then you know he's real because you developed a personal relationship with him and you see things that are happening that you yourself are incapable of doing that are manifesting all around you i'm living proof i can say it with all honesty i'm living proof so they're going to try to break 
basically the natural order of things. And this goes from micro to macro. They're trying to achieve some divinity in the material, some immortality in the material. You can't do it. So this is the abomination of desolation. And then the fullness of this idea is the serpent busting through the crown, which is basically the material consciousness. And then he enters into what he believes is his material realm, his material abode. He's coming forth from the spirit ceiling, but he is rising up from the abyss as he's moving upwards. He's coming through the material consciousness, which is the basic collective majority, the collective thought of the vibratory rhythm of the majority of the people in this world. This is why they're all about raise your vibration, raise your vibration, raise your vibration. Okay? So this collective consciousness, which we're not a part of, because we're not a part of a collective. We're not a part of a hive. We're, we're ultra individual. We can be whatever color we want, whatever race we want, whatever nationality we want, whatever religion we want, whatever size we want. Okay? We can be girl, boy. We can do it all because Jesus Christ said we could. You don't have to be a specific special day, a specific special clothing, a specific special church, or a specific special prayer. No. You just got to be yourself. And then walk in the two commands. And guess what? You're in the kingdom. They got it all wrong. They've tried to make him sound like he's all wrong. In reality, he's all right. He's all right. So, ah, they want to raise the vibration. Raise the vibration gives him the ability to rise through the medium of the collective consciousness, which begins to alter the distortion of the perception of mankind, which then breaks the seal, which also, as we know, is connected to the third eye within the forehead. If so many people are blind, that's what they're hoping because they're not going to realize that this guy is the fallen prince. They're going, if they're blind, they are going to have most likely the best chance of accepting him as their savior. And that's what they're hoping that everybody's blind because they got you guys way down here. And then they've been teaching their descendancy and their Lites to rise all the way up here, but they've been doing it with the wrong spirit. Okay. So they don't have Jesus Christ upon the cross. They've got this guy upon the cross. Well, guess whose vision is greater? <laughs> guess whose vision is greater yeah because if the serpent's vision was greater he would have never tried to pull this stuff in the first place because he would see where he's about to end up right now so the serpent's vision isn't too great okay um the serpent is being held by a greater power if you don't realize he's sealed so that must mean that he's being bound by a greater power than himself who could that greater power be well, it could be Jesus Christ, the creator of all that is. Even the creator of this prince in his original identity before he fell. Okay, so that's what the purple is all about, guys. It's about them achieving their crown chakra, which is basically being symbolized as the United States, being symbolized by the capital, the White House, which represents Ephraim, being English, being Caucasian, being white, represents his head. You look at the lightning rod on top, represents a fertility virgin of which they're going to sacrifice during childbirth, which is going to represent coming right on back to Samantha, the coding of Columbia. And then you can take the coding of Columbia and see the sacrifice displayed in space shuttle. Columbia was destroyed on its 28th mission, which brings us right on back to a lunar cycle. And then that's going to bring us back to Leviticus with a code of four sevens of judgment, which add up to 28, which follow the lunar cycle. And then it's going to bring us right on back here right now to Isaiah chapter 28, which is also all about the same coding of the understanding of the lunar cycle. All right. So if you want to hear from me, this is how it has to come. I have no other way to give you this information other than to just give you as much information as I know that will support what I'm telling you. All right. To the beginning of the movie now, um, let me just clarify before I get off here on a tangent that you saw the movie portray that this purple is associated with Ishtar as you saw Ishtar being symbolized with the owl archaeologically, symbolically, many other symbols also. You saw this Ishtar great owl figure being shown in Isaiah as inheriting this particular land. Well, just like you saw in the movie, Regina, the fertility goddess, 
being symbolized with the upside down triangle. The womb for the symbolizing her is inheriting land. There's the rabbit symbolizes the fertility. Can you not see that? Okay. So I'm telling you the truth. And uh, I'm just, I just want to make sure that, you know, that before we go further, you understand that the purple ain't got nothing to do out there with that Saturn planet. It's got everything to do with this destruction that they're about to achieve, which is the busting of the serpent. Okay, now the crown chakra represents the dome, which represents the United States. Okay, so we know in the fullness of the symbol symbology of the United States, the United States is going to experience a little destruction, but at the same time, it's going to achieve illumination, and that's what it's hoping to do. So as the serpent busts through and enters into the womb of the fertility goddess that's on the lightning rod up above, it's going to kill her during childbirth, okay? But it's the portion of her that's going to be killed during childbirth, which is commercial Babylon, a.k.a. everything associated with the Big Apple New York City, which is being portrayed by that symbolism of Sam as the material girl, red, white, and blue, in her adolescence. And then as you see, after they fake her death, um, they mature her rapidly, and then she's able to be fully taken on by Danny Mason Keeter. Okay, unreal. So that's what all the purple's about, guys. Anybody tells you different, they don't know the root. And they don't know the fruit. And if they keep refusing this, they're steering you wrong. They're steering you wrong. So why don't you guys start steering some people right? Okay? Because maybe let me catch your attention here real quick. This is Isaiah 28. I'm just going to skip right now to verse 2. Because this is going to be relative to our character, Regina, in the movie. And I'm about to kind of condense this and, and pull forward here a little bit here. Um, but just read verse 2. Behold. The Lord hath a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. Okay, somebody's actual hand. And we know whose actual hand that is. That's Revelation chapter 13, verse 13. The helm of Revelation 13, 13 that has the power to call the fire down on the sky on the entirety of the earth is the fulfillment of this line right here in verse 2. Behold, the Lord had hath a mighty and strong one. That mighty and strong one is Ephraim. The identity of Ephraim as he's evolved into the multitudes, which is he evolved into these ones that are perpetrating these plans, the chief of these multitudes, the united ones of these nations that are perpetrating these plans to try to destroy us all. Now, why is this relative to Regina? Which as a tempest of hail, what is the video game that Regina is playing? In the beginning of the movie, Regina, the fertility goddess, she's good, even very good, at playing Tempest. She can even beat Tempest. And you need to see that for what it is. Regina is good at playing Tempest. She ain't got no problem with it. She's going to survive it. That's ecclesiastical Babylon is going to survive this tempest. She's orchestrating this tempest. Okay? So this mighty and strong one that's going to deliver this tempest in this, in this interpretation from this scripture right here, as it's coming from the moon, is going to be the leader, the false shepherd of false Israel, Ephraim, who's going to be planted in a pleasant place when he does this. Ephraim shall be planted in a pleasant place. Ephraim being symbolized as planted is symbolizing Ephraim sort of like a tree, right? And I told you that they're going to be on the moon 20 years ago. I got this tree planted on the moon while they're bringing this destruction to the USA, which represents their very own children. And then it's all coded with the releasing immediately of these fake supposed aliens. It's all connected to the Satanism, which they're trying to twist up as them worshiping this planet Saturn, which they're going to try to further twist up as being the identity somehow of Jesus Christ. They're going to try to fulfill this later on, as you see in the strong delusion, as Enlil, and then they're going to try to fulfill this Enlil character as Jesus Christ himself, in which I've already showed you in the Bible that Jesus Christ clarifies three separate identities, three separate portions of this faction of which he is excluded from. And just don't fall for their BS. Don't fall for their bullshit. It's called bullshit for a reason. It's called a cock 
and Boo story because these cockatrices, these Nodite serpent beings, and then these bulls, these ancient Sumerian gods that have birthed these descendancies of Danites and Nodites and such. Now, it gets so much more deeper than that, but oh, you have to remember that there are. I'm going to just pause for one moment and get you guys to think about a verse that says something to the effect that the fathers, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, therefore their children's teeth are set on edge. And there's the spirit of truth in the Old Testament is saying, no longer will you have occasion to use this basic scripture, this saying and say that the children are damned and condemned for the sins of their fathers. That's what this spirit's saying. It says, you cannot condemn the children for the sins of their father. Well, it goes also for the descendancy of the fallen ones. The Nephilim, not all of the Nephilim children um, were evil like you guys have made to believe. There was two distinct factions that developed out of this. And some of these children from the descendancy, the inherency of these ancient fallen ones, did not turn out all evil. And this is where we get so much confusion in this world with these ancient architectures in stone, where you see some of these civilizations were built by, built by a master race, but they were loving and they were kind and they knew the true spiritual truth. And then some of these architectures were built by another race that sought dominance and then coded everything into the serpent. Okay, so we have two different distinctions of descendancy. Some maintain the path of the sons of light, even though they were born under descendancy that broke the seal, that broke a code, that broke a law, even though they were, the spirit of truth says you cannot judge the children just simply because they're children of eating sour grapes. Well, the sour grapes that they're eating are the grapes of Ishtar. And you need to read Ezekiel chapter 19 to see Ishtar depicted as a blood vine, this blood vine, this grape vine. And then this is why we're going to see these children here are drunken as you're going to get later on here in chapter 28 of Ephraim you're going to see that uh, there's a spin here with this drunkenness of Ephraim if you remember in the beginning of the movie uh, man this is, I'm so sorry if I go off track here Golly, I know I do I know I go all over the place <laughs> if some of you are new listen to this you're like Good gracious, man. And I understand. I'm, I, I, it's all so connected. I have no other way to say it than to tell you all of it at once. And maybe it's a fault of mine. I, I try to condense as best I can. Um, the beginning of the movie. Remember they're showing those people. And it says that line in the movie. It says, there were some who saw this as more than just a coincidence. But most didn't. Well, this is them trying to encode that the drunkards of Ephraim are those people, the common people that are out there partying about the comet and they don't realize anything's happening. And then there's another faction of people that do realize something's happening. They're going into the inner earth. So the spin here is, is that these secret societies affiliated with Ephraim and this agenda, they're thinking that this scripture pertains exactly the way they displayed it on that movie. That it's the common people of the nation of Ephraim, the nation of the United States, who are now all drunkards, are all gluttonous, are all slothful. Um, they're basically degenerates. They're dumbed down. They don't know anything. They're just sheeple, as everybody tries to call them, and which really not. They're people. They're not sheeple. They're people. They're people that have been done wrong and steered wrong, and the Father is going to uphold them through this deception. Well, this is why they believe they have the right to destroy because they're saying the drunkards of Ephraim, they're trying to believe that it's the people, the undesirables of this nation that they're trying to get rid of. And they believe that they're justified because they're all these things, gluttonous and druggies and alcoholics and criminals and all this stuff. That's what they try to make everybody. And that's what the news is trying to make everybody to kind of justify this subconsciously right now. But I'm going to tell you who the real drunkards of Ephraim are. They're the ones that are connected to this blood vine in Ezekiel chapter 19, which is connected to this queen of heaven, Ishtar, who is connected to the sacrifice. The blood that they're being drunk with is chapter 34 of the book of Isaiah. That's the blood. This is the true drunkards of Ephraim. 
Ephraim is the one that's going to bring his children to the murderer. Read the book of Hosea. Look that up in the Strongest Concordance. I don't necessarily have time to go to it. I've shown it so much. Um, I don't want to flip a bunch of pages. But here's that blood. All right. There's the blood. There's the blood. Think about it. There's all the blood. Their their land is soaked with blood. They're, they're just, it's being made fat with blood. The blood that it's being made fat with is from these people that got, that Yahweh has this curse on. Well, Yahweh has this curse on the believers in Jesus Christ. So the blood is the wine. The wine is a representation of the blood of Jesus. This wine, this new wine, this wine that doesn't get you drunk in a material way, get you lifted in a spiritual way. Well, now we see Ephraim is getting drunk. So the true, the true, the true meaning of this for those who are in false Israel that don't realize it, that are trying to think that it's the people of the world that you're being justified and get rid of, just like the movie's trying to show because they're all drunk. The true drunkards are you guys. Woe to the crown of pride. The crown of pride, what are you hoping to achieve? This lotus flower, this crown chakra, what is it? It's a crown of pride because you believe you're a chosen race. You believe you're chosen above everybody else to do all this. Wrong. That's, the, that's what pride is, guys. That's what ego is. So their crown of pride is associated with those that are trying to achieve the agenda of the fallen serpent king. Not the common peoples that are out there drinking a couple of friendly spirits. They're not trying to achieve no serpent illumination. They're not trying to achieve no crown of pride. So it can't be them who are the drunkards of Ephraim. It can't be the common people that have been deceived into becoming drunkards by biblical scriptures that say there's nothing better for man to do on earth than to, be, than to drink and be merry. That's all propaganda. That's all propaganda. So the real drunkards of Ephraim are these bloodthirsty, demon-following people that believe they're going to have some sort of blood sacrifice that's going to bring them some sort of party, some sort of golden age. They're the real drunkards, and they're getting drunk off the wine of the believers in Jesus Christ. What we're going to see is going to backfire on them. It's going to backfire on them. As I told you, he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. What goes around comes around hear that if you were with this faction that believes that you're going to commit and be a part of these people and sanction these people and back these people that are going to commit this to kill all these people you better hear me out i urge you to think about he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword that's you friend if you're going to kill with this sword if you're going to be privy and a party and become knowledgeable to the act you're just as guilty as everybody else. You are going to suffer the fullness of the ramifications of what you try to bring on us. We won't suffer it. We'll be comforted. And then we'll be exalted and glorified on the other side because we maintain faith in a few simple truths. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your father with all your might. Think about it. Who's drunk now? All right. We got some major things to talk about. <laughs> and I'm going to just... Now, you should know all about the, this color purple. You should know what all of this is all about. Um, and let's start off here at the beginning of one and see if I can kind of get a little further down here. Um, yes, they're trying to put the spin here that this is all connected with Nibiru. 19... 84 or 1983 is when in the Washington Post it was first posted that they have discovered some sort of monstrous um, object and they said they discovered it with that eye in the sky. How fitting. Go look at the, the report. Google the report. The Washington Post 1983 Nibiru discovered and you're going to see that they use the coding of the eye in the sky. We know who that is. That's the all-seeing eye. And then they're reporting this coming thing as some monster. What makes them believe it's already going to be a monster? Because they've already got it coded into the plan of what they want you to perceive it to be as a monster. So in 83, they first discover this. Well, the movie comes out in 84. So that means at least by 82, 83, they were making it. It took them a couple of years to make the movie. If not, it obviously took them time in the movie for it to be made within 1983. They already had all this coded symbolism injected into the movie, and this thing was supposedly first just discovered in 1983. What does that tell you? 
That tells you these guys are lying through their teeth that all of this is propaganda. If you want to know about the Nibiru, if you want to know about the Nibiru and the, and the binary star system and what the deception is they're spinning about it, I've got a series on it. I don't know if I got it on my playlist, but it's entitled Nibiru Orbital Deception. And I use the Iraqi dinar to show you guys what the true coding is all about, is bringing this serpent king into the fullness. And yes, there is going to be destruction that's associated with it. Okay? Um, I'm telling you, that system is real. It is there. But <laughs> it has not caused any catastrophe. Remember, it's supposed to come by every 3,600 years. Well, you got to realize that all those numbers are coded also. If we time this times 40, you end up getting 144,000. Does that sound familiar? That's 144,000 the supposed saved of the 12 tribes of Israel in the last days. All of this is coded with ancient Israel and its understanding of these ancient mysteries that it ain't telling nobody. It ain't telling nobody, but the spirit of truth is telling everybody. So they're going to they're gonna try to blame these these meteors and faked asteroids that they send, this hailstorm, this tempest that they send to us on the Nibiru, which is going to steer you from realizing that it's really come from the moon. And it's going to really steer you away from realizing why they have stopped people from going to the moon ever since the presidency of Kennedy. It's one of the reasons why Kennedy was assassinated, because he was steadfast on bringing this mission to the moon to the fullness. And guess what? They didn't want that to happen because they had already got to the moon and they were going to bring their mission to the fullness from it. The moon was the key. They could have never done none of this until they got to the moon and they had to evolve and progress their technology over time to bring them to the point to where they could pierce the heavens, the queen of heaven, and get themselves to the moon. To where they could have a safe place, Ephraim is planted in a pleasant place, a pleasant place to where they could enact this crime on us and at the same time they could feel all safe, right? Well, guess what? <laughs> Look how this works out. You see how the very pipe of their God is now burning and kindling their roots? Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting, guys? Good old Ephraim that's going to bring this nuclear-looking explosion, which now fulfills itself as this little worm sticking out, wormwood, fulfills itself as the tree, fulfills itself as a mushroom, a mushroom bomb, a mushroom cloud, and then now we have Ephraim planted in a pleasant place, the moon, which they've been preparing. They've been preparing, right? They've been preparing their pleasant place, and then look, give unto her double. Give unto her double. So Ephraim is also connected with Ishtar, which is also connected, is being planted in this place. But she's also being depicted as being planted in a dry and thirsty ground, in a dry and thirsty wilderness, which is going to be symbolized as the moon because it had no water until they started bringing it there to make it a pleasant place. Take notice, you guys that are on the other side. Spirit of Truth sees the truth. The question is, are you going to see it? Are you going to realize that I'm genuine? Are you going to realize that I got true care for you guys and, and, and true love for even the people that are against me, you know, that I'm trying to help you and that I'm not going to hold anything against you, that I'm going to welcome you with open arms on the other side as my friend and I will forget none of your trespasses. I will forget all of your trespasses against me. I will remember... None of your trespasses against me is what I should have said. So they're trying to spin this in connection with Nibiru. And you can understand that because they say this, an elliptical orbit so large. Well, that's exactly the same thing that Nibiru is supposed to have. This elliptical orbit so large. Well, if they just discovered it within that very moment, and they don't even know what it is yet, and you can see by reading the newspaper report, how do they know that it's got this huge elliptical orbit so large that now it's supposed to be scientific fact in modern times? It's because... They've known the spin on this forever. They know the true history of this object because this object does play a factor in the creation of our, our solar system, believe it or not. It helps to create some of the distorted anomalies that we have in our solar system. It actually helps to bring some of the matter or even all of the matter off of the evolving sun that begins to form the planets from gaseous 
material blobs into the slowly solidifying spheres that we all recognize as the planets around us that some are still in the process of. This Angona system, as many of you would call it, the binary dwarf star, is real. But it has long since stabilized. The thing is so gigantically immense, you guys have no idea the time that it would take for it to traverse through our system. And you're going to feel the effects from this over tens of thousands of years, not a couple of months. It's not going to mount up to a sudden destruction in a couple of months. We're not going to pass through a debris field of a couple of months. It's, it's thousands of years that take place that affect the pool of this thing's gravitational field. Even when it's 3,600 years out, it's still affecting us with a gravitational field. As it comes back in 3,600 years, we're being affected by its gravitational pull. Tens of thousands of years go by and we're experiencing this. We don't experience it all in a devastating, traumatic moment because the immensity of this object does not occupy our singularity of perception of moments of time on the lowest of levels. It occupies time on some of the highest levels. And that's why when you look at a plane that's going, you know, thousands of miles per hour to your eye at a distance, it looks like it's going slow. But if you were right beside that plane, you would realize that it is zooming super, 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 super fast. But the bigger the object, the slower the object relatively to your perception appears as it's moving. So the appearance of this object as it moves, as its mass towards our micro mass, means that this object is taking an enormous amount of time to just traverse one millisecond through the telescope from our perceptual view. People would live and die for many lifetimes before they would ever see this object move two centimeters across the screen. And they deny you from understanding that. They deny you from understanding that. So you just have to understand that there's a huge spin and they're already trying to spin it. They were spinning it in this movie, supposedly the first year that uh, their scientists admitted knowing about it. But in reality, they've known about it for a long time. It has destroyed civilizations in the past. You're going to find out. That's what I talk about in the videos. But it hasn't done any major destruction since about 11,000 to 14,000 B.C. We don't have any periodic destructions 3,600 years back. Check the geologic record. We don't have major catastrophes. We don't have a sign of a pole shift at 3,600 years back. But we do have this associated between 11 and 14,000 years, which means we've had at least roughly three or more cycles of no harm from this supposed monstrous Nibiru orbital death dwarf star system that they're going to try to pin all this on. Don't you understand that? Or are you just going to follow people that just post CNN newsreels about what CNN thinks about this? If you believe anything CNN says at this time, man, I don't know what to say to you. I don't know what to say to you. So, all right. These things take so long for me to do. Here we go at the three minute mark. And, uh, oh, at the two minute mark. So the drunkards of Ephraim are not the common people's friends. The fullness of this are those that are trying to get drunk off this blood sacrifice that are connected to this blood vine of Ishtar. All right? And they want to spin it and make it believe that it's the common peoples of the world. The common peoples of the world have been deceived. That's They call them sheeple. Guess what? They're also the lost sheep of Jesus Christ. Go ahead and you call them sheeple because Jesus Christ ain't going to lose a single one. A single one. All right? Minute number two, the movie theater, it's called El Rey. Did you get that? The movie theater where Regina works is called El Rey. Now, let's go ahead and show you what that means. Give me one second. you look at this real quick while I'm looking for it in 
just go ahead and read it. Follow the arrows. Follow the arrows here. Everything starts at the Eden portion. Okay? And that chakra is known as red. It's the Edenic chakra. It represents the apple. These are seven world ages of 5,125 year periods. This is the last one we're in now. This is where they're hoping to achieve their crown chakra. Just read that. Understand it as best you can. And I'm going to look for that thing about El Rey. If I can't find it, I'm going to come back with another video. You guys are invariably are going to end up just Googling it. But for those that don't or might be out doing something, I'll go ahead and and read it and then tell you what the spin is about it. You're just going to be blown away. You just will be blown away. Okay. I can't find it. I'm going to look one more time. And when I come back with the next video, I'm going to try to do my best to just kind of cruise through the movie symbols a little bit faster. And then maybe at the end, I'll kind of break down and talk about all this. Remember my Rabbi T chart, guys. Remember the Rabbi T chart and what nobody saw, nobody understands with the 44. And that remember my uh, man, it's so hard to go through these things with just papers. Remember this little serpent. Remember this two fours that come together. 44 mirrored. What do you see right here? 44 connected with chromosomes. Okay. I'm telling you that he's not going to be brought about by this unification of a sex act between a man and a woman. They're going to bring him about by this cloning of this serpent genetic where they're going to circum circumvent this. They're going to avoid this and produce it directly from this. This 44 is going to come together. And this is why you see the significance of these 8s and these 88s. He's represented as this 8. He's represented as this Alpha and Omega, which is an 8 on its side. Well, what did I show you here? Even I didn't try to do this and work it out together. It always just happens like that. I mirrored these two fours together. It makes a Mesoamerican style pyramid. You know that this Mesoamerican actor, as he's being displayed, symbolically representing all this. What is this being now going for? And now as we see the connection with the planet of crossing, supposedly that's what Nibiru is supposed to be called, the planet of crossing. I'm telling you that's the spin. They're trying to cover up what it's really all about. It's about the crossing of the genetics. These beings don't even come from this planet. But they are confusing the history of when a system did cross our path, and then now they're trying to fuse that these beings have come from this portion, and that the crossing that all the symbolisms about in ancient archaeology is only about this planetary system. That none of it is about the crossing of the genetics of the union of the fallen sons of God with the daughters of man, which was for them to achieve this goal. Which was them for them to achieve this goal of putting this being into the material form. That's why the serpent's going for that X. That's why... Somehow, I've got that exact same symbol for this crossing between these two paths. That's what he's going for. Don't forget the 44. Don't forget the connection with the Rabbi T. We'll talk about this later. Um, man, you guys just... You have, it's hard for me to tell you all this. Ah, uh, man, I'll tell you right, right on basically out as best my memory can do combined with all of these notes. Anyway, I'll be back and I'm going to tell you the connection with the L and I'm going to try to speed the rest of the information up.